The honeymoon idyll with my division during the Static War was destined to end soon. We were loaded onto a train and sent south. At 20 degrees of frost, Celsius, the unheated carriages with hard seats were of little use for sleeping. I thought back to my many railway journeys in the First World War. In those days it was enough to find oneself on a pile of straw in a horse-drawn carriage, where it was warm and sleep was disturbed only by the clatter of hooves. But those nights were usually over quickly, and for several days I had to make do with a handful or two of snow for a symbolic morning toilet, followed by a hot breakfast and a cigarette. The division, which I was now leading into the whirlwind of a swift and fateful war to save our army in Stalingrad, was materially weak. Only thirty tanks. There were no armored personnel carriers, one or two reconnaissance vehicles. Only thirty or forty percent of the trucks had been overhauled. This meant that in each battalion one company could move only in foot formation. Such companies were consolidated into a single battalion that followed behind the division. The repair company and even the workshops remained in the rear near Oral. Any lorry driver will understand what this means. Was it the result of suddenness, mad haste, or did it occur as a result of collapse? A rush did take place. It was mid-December, and it had been almost three weeks since the Russians had fought back decisively on the Eastern Front. This happened before we unloaded from the train to concentrate at Millerov. We did not know that the salvage operation would take place east of the Don. Instead, operational capabilities against the advancing enemy west of the Don were being studied. It was there that the front of our weak Hungarian ally had collapsed. While traveling eastwards across what seemed to be endless snowfields, my car met another. Out of it came the commander of the Romanian division, a lanky figure, a gaunt face. After a formal and rather strained exchange of greetings, we continued our conversation in French, for I wanted to familiarize myself with the situation of the Romanians. By his behavior, the Romanian general showed a clear alienation and a weakening of allied feelings as a result of the defeat of his army. Instead of deploying westwards, we were now marching southwards. Under terrible conditions, the division crossed the dawn at Simlianskaya. Despite a twelve-hour drive, I was unable to reach the headquarters of the 4th Tank Army. It was commanded by Colonel General Goth, who was familiar to me, so I spoke to him by telephone. Commander, do you realize that we must cope with this task in Stalingrad? I, uh, the task is clear to me, but I'm sure you know the deplorable state of armament of my division. Commander, at the front, some divisions are in even worse condition. Yours has an excellent reputation. I rely on you. In the last more or less favorable location of our position on the march, I tried to make sense of the theoretical discrepancies between my knowledge of strategy and our tactical task. I was struck by the inadequacy of the forces assigned to save Stalingrad. Not far in front of me, only 90 kilometers from the army surrounded in Stalingrad, were fighting two divisions. One of them, the 6th Panzer Division, was lucky because recently, when it was still based in France, it was brought to full combat readiness, and the second, the 23rd Panzer Division, according to rumors, was equipped even worse than mine. One staffed and two half-staffed divisions were to take the offensive to a depth of about a hundred kilometers all the way to Stalingrad. The so-called surprise was already gone. The two divisions involved in the battle were stopped by the superior forces of the Russians. But even if the surprise would have taken place, they would not have been able to stay deep in the captured area. No one could count on the fact that the enemy would not do everything in his power to prevent the unblocking of the encircled Sixth Army and thus consolidate its great victory. The weakness of the German attacks showed that there were no reserves available. Moreover, there was no question of Paulus's army still numbering 100,000 troops, breaking through to link up with the 4th Panzer Army. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 15 to 16 December 1942, Map 1. On 15 December, units of the Russian 65th Tank Brigade and 81st Cavalry Division were found near Verkhmikarmoyarskaya. 
The commander of the German 4th Panzer Army intended, apparently, to send my division its left flank along the Don in a northeasterly direction. Accordingly, Biesing's tank group, he was the regimental commander, was ordered to move towards Verknikermoyerskaya via Topolov, which it reached without contact with the enemy. The motorized groups of Grenadier regiments did not reach the Shinkovskaya area until 16 December because of the delay of the crossing at Simlianskaya. Meanwhile, orders came from the 57th Army Corps that my division should suddenly reach Generalovsky, standing on the Aksai Isolovsky River, and seize a bridgehead there in order to relieve the pressure on the 6th Tank Division fighting east of this area. The enemy was reportedly to withdraw at least part of his forces from Verknikermoyerskaya and Nizhnyabloknoi and move them to the northwest, presumably to attack from the flank and rear the bridgehead at Selivskoy, which was already under heavy pressure from the front. The advancing tank group was unable to locate enemy forces on the Don. The day before, his units had moved north of Nagavskaya. The districts of Verknyabloknoi, Nizhnyabloknoi, and Verknikermoyerskaya were reportedly unoccupied by the enemy, but heavily mined. In the latter area, the bridge to the north was in enemy hands. Now the German tanks could not advance from the place they had reached. There was no fuel. All the roads had been rutted as a result of the thaw. The road along the Don, according to reports, was impassable, as was the road through Pachlebin, along which the corps commander intended to send my division. That evening, the long-awaited frost set in. During the day, the division had finished reconnaissance of roads suitable for all weather conditions, so that on the 17th it could move its wheel units, or even its tanks, in the direction of General Lovsko. I hoped to be able to move the tank group from its present positions to Verknijablokny, where it could join the division. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 17 December 1942. Map 1. Leaving the area of concentration at 5 a.m., I led Zietz's group, consisting of the 63rd Grenadier Regiment, reinforced by the 27th Jager Platoon, Regimental Headquarters, the 3rd Platoon of the 27th Artillery Regiment, and one company of the 27th Reconnaissance Battalion, along a previously reconnoitered route through the points of Majorsky, Kotelnikovo, Verkniablokny, where we made a halt from 10. 15 to 11.00 in the direction of General Lovskoy, which we captured, and by 14.15, with weak enemy resistance, organized a bridgehead on the opposite bank. The only opposition from the enemy came from rocket launchers and attacks from aeroplanes on a shaving flight. The sudden introduction of a motorized group without tanks into the battle had the following results. 1. It was confirmed that the area west of the battle group to the Aksai Isolovsky section was free of the enemy. 2. All communications between the units of the 65th Tank Brigade, the 81st Cavalry Division, remaining on the Don, and the main forces that had moved to the northeast, which the enemy could still engage, were cut off. 3. The springboard for tomorrow's rush to attack the Russians from the right flank north of Aksai Isolovsky, where the German 4th Panzer Army could not advance a step. There are attacks against the enemy's organized line of tank defenses failed, and there were considerable losses. 4. We were warned of a similar operation on the part of the enemy, who, as we learned from radio intercepts, intended to use only motorized units to cut off the supply routes of our 6th Panzer Division along the coast. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 18 December 1942, Map 2. On the night of the 17th, I tried to send as much reinforcements as possible to the new bridgehead, which we held with the small forces of the regimental group. But it did not arrive in time to be engaged in tank support for further offensive support on the 18th. Nevertheless, I decided to attack with the available forces, as this created a surprise effect. Two artillery batteries were attached to the 63rd Grenadier Regiment for this offensive. The tank regiment was moved to the bridgehead gradually one platoon at a time. Frost gave an opportunity to refuel the tanks with fuel. The plan was to hold this bridgehead until the rest of the regiment approached, after which to resume the attack. The first target was the collective farm, 
8 Martha, one of the key points of the entire Russian defense system. It was then planned to break through the Russian front with an attack on Verknikomsky and thus ensure the advance of the 6th Panzer Division along the whole front, which at the moment stopped on the left flank of the 4th Panzer Army. The advance of the 1st Tank Platoon was delayed because its commander had taken the wrong route. They went out on a slope on which the tanks, especially the T-4s, risked rolling down the icy crust below. Until I got to them and redirected the platoon along the road to the north, it was impossible to launch a concerted attack by the three main units. A fierce tank battle continued around this collective farm for a whole hour until the enemy finally retreated. This happened around 11.00. Fifteen enemy tanks were destroyed, most of which were immobilized and used as fixed firing points. It is unclear whether this tactic was due to lack of fuel or the decision to stand to the death. The Manoeuvre tank battle was against enemy tanks coming from the north. Our tanks withdrew to the west and then attacked in a northeastern direction, forcing the enemy to retreat. Fortunately, the Russians did not choose the more effective tactic of attacking with tanks from the northwest, which would have caused confusion in my division. During this battle, a reinforced group of the 40th Grenadier Regiment, building on the success of the tank group, took the exposed left flank under its defense. It was reported from court headquarters that the enemy, confident that the attack was developing towards his right flank, was taking up a new line of defense along the heights north of Verknikomsko. We therefore abandoned the original plan, which envisaged such a turn of events and a frontal attack in this case by the 6th Panzer Division. Instead, we resumed the attack on the heights located to the northeast. But already at 15.00 darkness fell, and we were unable to complete the attack. Further attempts by the enemy to attack with tanks from the north were repelled this day without much difficulty. The 6th Panzer Division was also unable to advance significantly to the north and capture Verknikomsky on this day, as resistance was still strong. Another reason for this could have been that the tanks of the Russian 85th Tank Brigade which, according to available information, had advanced in the direction of Dorofiv, had left the southern bank of the river under the onslaught of the German division. During the attack of German units on the collective farm, eight Marta Russian tanks were seen south of this point. They were retreating towards Verknikomskoy. Thus, the 6th Panzer Division again managed to occupy Dorofiv. On this day, it turned out to be possible not only to repel on the bridgehead threat to the 6th Panzer Division, but also to create a threat themselves deep into the right flank of the enemy. Everything had reversed itself. My division not only fought well, but in the course of this flexibly conducted offensive, for the first time in a long time, quickly adapted to my methods. Therefore, by sending an advanced battle group into the fight, I was able to achieve effective support for all three of the division's battle groups, a satisfactory result. My division lost 50 men killed, while the enemy lost one tank and 150 prisoners. His losses in killed have not been ascertained. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. 19 December 1942, Map 3. On this day and on the following night the fighting was not interrupted. It was the climax of the whole operation, for in an attempt to save the 6th Army reached the northernmost point, after which the retreat began. The battle took place in several stages. At 5 a.m. the assaulting units resumed their attack with the aim of capturing the stronghold at Verknikomskoy, which was still stubbornly defended. Court's orders directed the 17th Panzer Division to advance in an easterly direction, northeast of this settlement, and to occupy the heights north of it. The enemy, forced to abandon Verknikomsky, could not be allowed to gain a foothold on these heights. At the same time during this attack, the 6th Panzer Division was to link up with mine and thus complete the encirclement of Verknikomskoy. By 6.20 a.m., the 63rd Assault Group had reached these heights from the south and the tank group from the north. But before the 6th Panzer Division managed to close the ring, from our front line reported rapid enemy movements on the preserved road between Verknikomskoy and Nishnikomskoy. Fire was opened from several hundred meters away, and at the same time our forward lines were bombed by our own aircraft, 
the pilots of which remained ignorant of the location of the division's forward detachment. To the south, the 63rd Assault Group was tasked with repelling a tank sortie from Verkhnkumskoy. By 9.00, the 6th Panzer Division had broken into it from the south. I had the impression that the ring around Verkhnkumskoy should very soon close. Insignificant groups of the enemy managed to break out of this locality from the other side. As the situation was changing rapidly, I decided, without waiting for orders from above, to terminate the operations of my tank group here and send it to pursue the enemy retreating from Verknikumsko to Nishnikumsko with the aim of reaching the Mishkova River section before the enemy could gain a foothold there and receive reinforcements from the north. The 63rd Group was ordered to make contact with the 6th Panzer Division and block the last northern exit from Verknikumskoy. As the enemy tanks aimed northeast, I deployed T-4 tanks to the left to protect the advance from the flank. They engaged, forcing the enemy tanks to retreat and knocking down several of them. Several times the forward group of tanks was attacked by our own dive bombers. By about 11 a.m. the ring around Verknikumskoy had closed, and this settlement was occupied and cleared. The remaining Russian units used the numerous folds in the terrain to withdraw in a southwesterly direction. Meanwhile, our tank group under my direct command was boldly advancing in the direction of Nizhnikumskoy. I considered it important to capture this settlement because it would provide defense of the flank of the 4th Army. And I also hoped to create a bridgehead behind the Mishkova River section in order to turn eastwards from there and resume the attack together with the neighboring 6th Panzer Division. At 12.45 we reached Nizhnikumskoy, part of which we occupied, breaking the enemy resistance while our tanks surrounded this settlement. The northern bank of the river was occupied by fresh enemy forces approaching from the north, and they had an opportunity to link up with the units retreating from Verknikumskoy. A battalion of the 40th Group, sent after the tank platoon to provide infantry support, was unable to reach the place by daylight. Its advance was hampered by the ensuing darkness and the search for a road, so it did not arrive there until 17.30. Previous reconnaissance on the division's left flank had established that large enemy forces were advancing in a southerly direction. Their advance was partly halted by a battalion of the 40th Group operating west of the collective farm, 8 Martha, partly by artillery operating on this section of the front. Apparently, these Russian forces had been pulled from the Don, before which they had occupied positions on that river, forming a front facing west. In some localities on the Don, such as Chosovskoy, reconnaissance found enemy units up to a battalion strength. The bridgehead at Generalovskoy, from which my division had withdrawn, could not be left to prevent its rear communications from being disrupted. It was also important to keep at least a battalion west of the collective farm, 8 Martha, to provide flank defense. Air reconnaissance showed that the village of Chernomorov, six kilometers northwest of Nizhnikumskoy, was occupied by the enemy, and this was confirmed by prisoners who reported that the 4th Mechanized Regiment of the Russians was there. Shortly after noon, our court headquarters drew attention to the fact that Although my division's advance had so far carried the neighboring 6th Panzer Division, the 23rd Panzer Division following it had not broken out of its bridgehead at Kruglikov, Map 4. Then I ordered the 17th Panzer Division to turn sharply to attack Gromoslaka, and the tank group to turn and move east of Nizhnikumskoy, to the same locality. The 63rd Group, which until then had been tied to Verknikumskoy, was also sent there. This attempt failed, because from Verknikumsko to Gromoslaka there was no direct road, and all the others were still in the hands of the enemy by nightfall. The last bulletin confirmed the situation in the entire area of responsibility of our corps. As expected, the enemy withdrew his troops only at the point of breakthrough in the direction of Verknikumskoy, Nishnikumskoy, and nowhere else on the front line occupied by our corps. Therefore, I decided to return the 63rd Group also to the area of Nizhnikumskoy, and from there to deploy the main forces of the division to the east to support thereby their neighbors. 
but this meant that on the exposed left flank had to leave three battalions on a stretch of 25 kilometers to prevent a breakthrough of the enemy from the west and northwest. I decided to break through to Gromoslavko along the northern bank of the Mishkova River. It was very difficult to attack from the south, as on the northern bank the enemy occupied dominant heights. The decision to send the division from Nizhnikumskoy eastwards along the northern bank to Gromoslavka, and, in accordance with the order of the corps commander, to protect the western flank with minimum forces, was based on the assumption that the enemy would hardly throw very powerful forces on such a weak section of the front from our side and would not cut the supply lines of my division. However, the events of the night of 19 December showed that for the key point of Nizhnikumsky this assessment was wrong. Before the end of the night I intended to create a bridgehead on the northern bank to ensure the continuation of the offensive. It would not only serve us as a springboard, but would also contribute to the improvement of the situation and the defense of Nizhnikumskoy. The radiograms received at the end of the day from the Army and Army Group Headquarters contained wishes for success in this daring venture and orders to pursue the enemy all night without respite. The relevant entry in the division's combat log reads as follows. A night pursuit was out of the question due to the unexpected strengthening of enemy resistance and lack of fuel. The section of the Mishkova River was occupied by large enemy forces, which were constantly arriving. The rapid capture of the bridgehead on the northern bank was prevented by brutal street fighting in Nizhnikumskoy, bridges over the Mishkova River destroyed by the enemy, and icy sections of the ford. The locality was subjected to intense shelling by enemy rocket launchers and tanks. The German assault group suffered heavy losses in Nizhnikumskoy, from artillery fire from the northeast and tank fire from the west. At 20.00, the 63rd Group, advancing on Nizhnikumskoy, was stopped by heavy fire 500 meters south of this settlement. There was a delay in the release of a battalion of the 40th Group, which was to join the tank group for a strike on Gromoslavka. It could not be released until 2.30 on the 20th. Half an hour later, after heavy fighting, the locality was cleared of the enemy, and from a small bridgehead captured on the north bank, it was possible to repel counterattacks and take 50 prisoners. During the previous 24 hours, the total number of prisoners had totaled several hundred. At 4.30 a.m., we were deciding whether to send a tank group along the south bank eastwards to the Gromoslaka area, as time was running out and the situation in Nizhnikumskoy remained uncertain. With the support of large reinforcements, the enemy broke through to this settlement. Brutal street battles broke out, in which the commander of the 63rd Grenadier Regiment, Lieutenant Colonel Beats, the commander of one of the battalions and many others were killed. The regiment suffered heavy losses. In such a situation, the tank regiment's offensive on Gromoslavka had to be cancelled, as it was needed to restore our position in Nizhnikumskoy. I was on the alert, and at dawn began the attack. We moved slowly, and before noon on 20 December, we had failed to gain a foothold in this settlement. After noon, a reinforced tank group could go to Gromoslavka. There was no continuation of the attack because the enemy occupied the dominant heights and was able to prevent any offensive action. Over the next two days, the 6th Panzer Division was pulled back. It held its position only on a tiny bridgehead north of the coastal section. The court had to go on the defensive and take up positions in depth. This was the only way to help maintain communications with the surviving units. It was indeed a total defeat. The enemy had obviously put into battle powerful forces. What I had feared at the beginning of the operation to save the 6th Army was beginning to come true. The Russians were not going to allow one weak corps to steal from them a grand victory at Stalingrad, especially after our offensive had advanced us 30 kilometers to that great city. The attempt to save the 6th Army should have been abandoned. My division suffered heavy losses. 300 men may seem a small fraction of the division's total strength of 10,000 men. But since these 300 came mostly from the weakened Grenadier Regiment, they were relatively large. The regiment was now commanded by a lieutenant. 
But in addition to the losses, sleepless nights and 20-degree frost had exhausted all the combat units. They no longer perceived words of encouragement on the march. Any encouragement sounded insincere. I suggested to the court commander to choose defensive positions in such a way that there were places near the front where soldiers could be warmed. I spent the evening of the 22nd in the least damaged tank regiment, which still had 23 combat-ready tanks. Since they had to be kept in formation, they entrenched themselves, taking up a circular defense. The crews, at least, could take shelter in the tanks from the harsh penetrating wind. The officers lit a small fire to warm their frozen limbs. Desperation and uncertainty reigned all around. The division's operations office and command post were so close to the front line that they remained vulnerable to the enemy for long periods of time. However, this morale boosted the troops. The command post was still on the northern bridgehead of the southern section of the river, from where my division had led the entire corps four days earlier. This bridgehead now had a perimeter of 30 kilometers and was held by four exhausted divisions. I was trembling at the prospect of receiving a new order from higher headquarters to stand to the last man, to the last bullet. That would be the end of our division. Christmas Eve had been a terrible day, and the enemy was seeping in wherever he could at the junctures of battalions. Henceforth, there was no concerted defense, no reliable communication between its separate nodes. One battalion was surrounded and destroyed by enemy tanks. In the early morning of the 25th, the division headquarters moved to the south bank. A pontoon bridge was built on the split ice. The salvation of the battalion still on the north side of the river depended on this bridge, as the newly arrived infantry unit, the only fresh and in fighting condition, was to cross to the north side. Its counterattacks would have weakened the enemy's onslaught on our troops, without which our withdrawal would not have succeeded. However, the overall operational situation also deteriorated. The Corps was threatened with encirclement from the eastern flank, which since the strange summer offensive in the Caucasus defended quite weak units. Therefore, it was decided to use the 17th Panther Division as a mobile reserve, placing it behind the 23rd Panzer Division, which was to be withdrawn. This replacement, under enemy fire, of some battle-worn battalions by others equally exhausted, could only have been caused by so-called out-of-the-saddle orders. Each regiment was reduced to 180 to 200 bayonets, and the temperature had fallen to 30 degrees below zero. On the 25th, as darkness fell, I moved a little away from the river and took up a command post in the front line, while headquarters was preparing a field command post for an operational command group a little further to the rear. During the first hours of darkness, I was in the front line and used an alcohol burner to make tea from the supplies I always had with me. The supply officer had contrived to make a Christmas cake. In the clear, cold air, the steps seemed to stretch as far as the horizon. These vast expanses absorbed the sounds of battle, which seemed muffled. The stars sparkled brightly in the sky. The failure of the rescue operation can be explained by several reasons. The army headquarters had to know the scale of the Stalingrad disaster. There were heated discussions between the chief of army staff and Hitler regarding the retreat of the 6th Army and the attempted breakthrough. There is no need to waste words discussing Hitler's senseless decision to leave the 6th Army where it was. More controversial is the question of whether the officers of the OK Gauhim and general staff correctly assessed the impact of this defeat on the outcome of the war. Here, as with some similar events in World War II, there is a danger of obscuring the historical truth. The blame for this defeat is attributed solely to Hitler's decision. But as a result, they leave out of sight the actual danger of this defeat, which was already evident at the time of the encirclement of the Sixth Army, and to compensate for it, apparently, was no longer possible. It was a brilliant move by Stalin to order the encirclement of Paulus' army by frontal strikes on both flanks, where it was easy to break the weak Romanian and Italian allies of Germany. After the encirclement, the German high command should have recognized the fact that the enemy had seized the initiative. The Russians now had two courses of action. They could allow a significant part of their advancing troops, encircling Stalingrad from the north and east, to complete the destruction of the Sixth Army 
which would allow them to use the growing forces for an offensive on other parts of the front. Or they could have used a more daring and classical method of holding back the Sixth Army with a very small force, and then used the freed-up troops to attack west of the Don against the almost defeated and incapable Italian and Romanian units, push them to the southwest, occupy the crossings across the Don, and thus cut off in the Caucasus the First Tank Army and the Fourth Army fighting east of the Don. The attempted operation to rescue the Fourth Tank Army between the Don and the Volga did not rule out any of these options. If the Russians had decided, as they actually did, to keep their main forces around Stalingrad, this would have been enough to contain the Sixth Army, which was becoming less and less dangerous with each day of the siege. But if the Russians had decided to use the available forces to strike Rostov and advanced in that direction, which also happened, but not so quickly, the offensive actions of the 4th Panzer Army would in any case have stopped. Its rear communications would have been under constant threat. It was characteristic of the Russians during the Second World War that their successful battles ended not with unambiguous decisions that could lead to the final result, but with one or another compromise, which was becoming customary. So it also turned out in Stalingrad. The second of these options, apparently, seemed to the Soviet high command too risky, because, despite the victory, during the pursuit, the Russians would have to defend their outstretched flanks. By launching an offensive west of the Don, the Soviet high command could not only throw superior forces against the 4th Tank Army, but also threaten its now inevitable retreat. And the Russians would not need much strength to achieve superiority over the 4th Tank Army, consisting of one weak corps with the 17th and 23rd Tank Divisions, whose combat effectiveness after long battles was very low. That is why this corps could not participate in the offensive of the 57th Corps after the arrival of the 17th Panzer Division. But if someone was still mistaken in assuming that the corps reinforced by the 17th Division would be able to break through to join the encircled army, the question remained, how could the hungry and not very mobile 6th Army be withdrawn through a narrow corridor a hundred kilometers wide, while being subjected to the most brutal attacks? it was clear that there were not enough forces to defend its outstretched flanks. The difficulties of such a defense had already been voiced when assessing the previous actions of the 17th Panzer Division, when it had to add three battalions to protect the threatened left flank. The final decision of the commander of the 57th Panzer Corps was to place the 17th Panzer Division behind the 6th Panzer Division, which occupied a small and vulnerable from all sides bridgehead and then as a striking force to send the latter to the offensive on a very narrow section of the front towards the 6th Army. I personally witnessed what happened in the direction of the main strike, and I am convinced that at this stage the 6th Army could no longer go to the breakthrough in connection with the 4th Tank Army, because they had fuel for only 30 kilometers. Moreover, the 4th Army was losing its fighting strength every day. By the night of 10 December battalions of the 17th Panzer Division had already three days and three nights of fierce fighting in the cold below 15 degrees, and only that night lost 275 people killed, which is equal to the combat strength of one battalion. One could calculate how many more days and nights the two divisions would hold out at this rate of loss. This showed once again how erroneous it was to ignore the exhaustion of the personnel in assessing the situation. Only those who saw the expression on the faces of our soldiers, listless with fatigue, even in those units where morale was quite high, could appreciate the loss of their fighting ability and physical strength. The decision to terminate the rescue operation was imposed, as is always the case in war, by the victorious side. For weeks the 17th and 23rd Panzer Divisions fought their way back east of the Don, constantly under threat of defeat or encirclement, while the 6th Army was left abandoned to its fate. My opinion of the situation, which I give here, was shared by many officers at the time. What we could not realize at the time was that the Battle of Stalingrad turned out to be one of several decisive battles of the Second World War. Not only because it was marked by the loss of an entire army in the most dismal of circumstances, 
but also because it was the climax after which defensive action was imposed on the Axis powers. The Allied military capabilities had clearly proved their superiority. Nevertheless, the war did not end at this turning point, but stretched on for years. Among other things, it shows how powerful the means of defense had become thanks to the mobility of the motorized armies and their equipment with armor that could prevent the enemy from making full use of tank breakthroughs. However, this does not mean that the defeated side, having lost the initiative, has any chance of changing the outcome of the war. After a battle like Stalingrad, it was time for strategy to be determined by politicians, provided they wanted to end the war. It has been suggested in hindsight that the demise of the 6th Army ensured the withdrawal of the 1st Panzer Army from the Caucasus. Indeed, the 6th Army's prolonged resistance was one of the factors that made it possible for the 4th and 1st Panzer Armies to link up. But it is a weak consolation to lose one army to save another. To finish the war, it is necessary to have a viable government, and not one that has already decided in the event of defeat to withdraw itself, in other words, to remain politically passive, and which denies the principle of Clausewitz IV about the subordination of the military to the opinion of politicians. The experience of command, I've of those days of fighting described above, 17, 18, and 19 December had some features that at that time became typical of many armored divisions. The division commander personally led the advanced forces of a powerful and mobile assault group. Such a technique was based on the following principles. 1. Control of the operation at the time of the main strike directly by the division commander, who utilizes his combat experience and applies personal authority. 2. Close combat cooperation between the three main branches of the forces, tanks, infantry, artillery, under his direction. 3. Separation of duties between the division commander, who is with the forward striking units, and the chief of staff operations, who is permanently stationed at the field command post. The practice of tactical control from the forward position was inherited from the cavalry and continued in the tradition honoring German panzer divisions. In the meantime, however, conditions had changed radically. During the offensive in Poland, France, and to a lesser extent in Russia in 1941 to 1942, the panzer divisions were so equipped with tanks that the climax of the battle depended entirely on this type of armament. Since these tank squadrons were launched into battle in the manner of the old cavalry attack, with the aim of cutting deeply into the enemy's defenses despite the fire of his artillery. The division commander could hope to maintain control of his constantly moving units if he himself moved with one of the tank waves and gave orders by radio. It was a technique used in the early stages of any campaign when the enemy was either caught by surprise, hopelessly weak, or indecisive in defense. Since then, however, the nature of warfare itself has imposed changes both in the form of attack and in the organization of the division. In decisive battles it was no longer out of the question to face a weak enemy, nor could the balance between the two opposing sides be maintained for long periods. Tanks were no longer confronted with weak defensive positions, but were countered by often powerful armored forces. On the fronts it was no longer possible to make here and their breakthroughs hundreds of kilometers deep, and the former queen of battlefields, infantry, demonstrated its value in a brutal, purposeful battle. Still, infantry could not operate in isolation. As before, it needed artillery, but now it also needed tanks if it was to confront the enemy offensively and defensively. Motorization and close attachment to tanks made infantry as mobile as tanks, if not more so. Therefore, combat became characterized by rapid changes and a constantly changing environment. Artillery was still needed. Equipped with tractors and self-propelled guns, it had to be as mobile as tanks and infantry. At this stage of the war, the German High Ground Forces Command capitalized on the shortage of material. It left panzer divisions like my 17th in the condition I have described above, without making any attempt to make them combat ready again. Such weakened divisions met the operational requirements of the moment. 
For the most part, they stayed where they were needed rather than using new material to make up for the losses of those divisions engaged in combat. Tank units were operating on all parts of the front, but no longer anywhere in the massive numbers needed at the start of the invasion. Although tactics had changed fundamentally in many respects, one thing remained unchanged in all the engagements I have described. The mobility of combat control remained an important factor, but he who controls mobile combat operations must be able to observe the battlefield, know the terrain, and expect his orders to be carried out quickly. It does not matter whether the combat team is led by a division commander or, as previously envisaged, by a brigade commander but it is desirable that he should not at the same time be the commander of one of the units of the three main branches of the troops that are to cooperate in the battle. In my division, there were no brigade commanders anymore, so it was so important for me to personally lead the front line and the most important battle group. The division's tank corps was small and required tight control. Since the outcome of the battle, as always, depended on the tanks, the division commander had to be on top of the situation. The tactics of using tanks had also changed considerably. They were no longer sent in a fixed direction deep in the rear of the enemy, but, like cavalry, used to consolidate the success, already half achieved by the infantry. If in this case they encountered a defensive line not yet ripe for attack, they were usually withdrawn and aimed in another direction where there were more prospects for success with fewer casualties. To be able to control the tank battle, the division commander usually moved behind the second wave of tanks during the decisive attack and did not have to be directly involved in the battle. Forward tanks must engage in a rapid duel at short ranges with limited visibility, and this is not the place from which to keep an eye on the entire battlefield. It is realistic if you stay a few hundred meters behind the fighting tanks. True, there the commander is vulnerable to enemy artillery fire, but he is out of range of his tanks, otherwise he would be threatened by all opposing forces. Depending on the combat situation, the division commander will frequently change his position between the tank and infantry battle groups. When he is constantly in the infantry position, he is more comfortable and relaxed in observing the battle. Periodically he moves to a forward command post between the tanks and infantry. For this purpose, he uses a commander's tank or armored vehicle equipped with two radio transmitters to keep in continuous communication with his battle groups. He does not require an officer watching ahead for artillery. Before the battle begins, each battery is tasked with providing support to a specific battle group. As part of that group, each battery has its own observation officer, the artillery regiment commander, who, as before, must command the whole regiment keeps in touch with the division commander through the chief of operations of his headquarters, who is in the rear at a fixed command post. On the advance of the infantry, the commander gets an idea of the enemy's strength, his fighting order and intentions. Artillery fire is directed from the enemy's anti-tank barrages. The enemy's artillery fire gives accurate information about his power and his chosen direction of main attack. The overall picture is formed when there is a protracted and indecisive battle, and the division commander does not expose his infantry to unnecessary risk. Now it is time for the division commander, who, together with the tank group commander, is overseeing the battle, to give the tanks the order to go on the attack. If the attack meets unexpected resistance in one area, it is moved to another area where the artillery is used to weaken the enemy's anti-tank defenses until they are ripe for attack. The tank group commander who moves forward within or beyond the sight of his division commander knows that he is not obliged to bring the attack to a climax. Depending on his own chosen tactics, he may interrupt it and resume it at the point that promises him the best prospects. When a tank attack begins, the division commander, directing the battle groups, must provide the tanks with the necessary protection from the infantry, whose actions are supported without delay by artillery. Artillery barrage is as vital to the tanks as it is to the infantry. At the division's fixed command post are the chief of operations, the personnel of the operations department, the chief of communications, and the artillery regimental commander. Maintaining radio contact with the division commander, they liaise closely with him 
the chief of operations having a great degree of independence. In an emergency, he gives orders to all units that are not directly subordinate to the division commander. He orders the rest of the division to move behind the battle group, organizes cover on the flanks, which usually requires considerable force, and keeps reserves with him. He maintains liaison with court headquarters, from which intelligence is received, as well as with neighboring corps, and with the rear guard chief on supply matters. Thus, the chief of operations acts in the same way as in the presence of the division commander, only his responsibility increases. Experience has shown that, at the stationary command post, the chief of operations gets a better idea of the progress of the battle by radio communication with the division commander than by collecting reports from the units engaged in the battle. The point is that he receives information directly from the most experienced commander, whose authority extends to all weapons. But this does not mean that reports from field commanders become unnecessary. They add detail to the picture of the battle situation received from the division commander, making it as objective and ready for evaluation as possible. Needless to say, the division commander's presence on the front line has a psychological effect on the troops. He has the opportunity to observe his soldiers and ensure that his orders are clearly carried out, and this can be crucial. If subordinates know that the division commander is nearby, it speeds things up at critical moments. Junior commanders who are failing in their tasks may be assisted immediately, but a brief word of encouragement is usually sufficient. Moreover, the division commander is in constant contact with those who bear the brunt of the battle. The battalion commanders, at this stage of the war, they were like commanders of smaller battle groups. If it is necessary to inspire the troops by personal example, they should lead the shock units themselves, coordinating their actions with the advance of the division commander. They should also know that they will receive due credit if their actions are successful. At night, the division commander goes to his stationary command post, which moves close to the front line during the offensive. There he discusses with the chief of operations the next day's task. From there, he also contacts the corps commander and reports to him his impressions of the progress of the fighting. These impressions are very important because they are a compression of his own experience and reports from the units under his command. This gives him the right to resist the senseless demands from above and to put forward counter-proposals. Unfortunately, the strong-willed tactical thinking imposed by Hitler was too readily adopted by the army and became all too familiar in World War I. The principles of operational control described above were applied as follows. 17 December, attacking a motorized infantry battle group on unexplored terrain. No tanks were available that day. To create a springboard and maintain local superiority. Use of mobile infantry on wheels. Map 1. 18 December, attack by the same battle group even before the tanks appeared in order to start the battle without delay. At the critical moment of help to the infantry on high, tanks are sent into the battle, which, making an encompassing maneuver and distracting the enemy tanks, begin to attack his first stronghold and capture it. Continuation of the covering offensive with all forces in order to encircle the second important stronghold so that the neighboring division can enter the battle. Map 2. 19 December. Continuation of the planned covering maneuver. In accordance with the order, tanks attack and withdraw from the battle, taking care not to take damage, then use their mobility and combat power. They are to move independently along the general line of advance forward towards Stalingrad. Map 3. December 20. Contrary to the orders of the Corps' command, independent decision to go to recapture Nizhnikumskoy in order to more accurately assess the enemy positions and provide protection for the left flank of the Corps. These three days of fighting were critical in the battle for Stalingrad. They illustrate the operational management process I have described. Circumstances were inescapable as the division had to push forward in an environment that could not be foreseen. Other circumstances, especially in defense, required a different mode of operational control. The form of command, as well as the nature of the commander's decisions, can always be challenged. In my case, both were dictated by changing combat conditions and were born instinctively. 
Such techniques are very valuable when you have to act quickly based on decisions arising from the impression of the battle in progress. No two days of battle are alike. The struggle for self-preservation. Since 26 December my division, together with the even more weakened 23rd Panzer Division, had been fighting for survival. The latter had already been bypassed from the east, while my division in the west still maintained contact with Romanian units. Soon, however, Romanian resistance was broken, and the western flank of the corps was also threatened. After the Russian breakthrough in the section of the 23rd Panzer Division on 26 December, the higher command decided to withdraw to a bridgehead near Kotelnikov. In this critical situation I was for some time at the forward CP, located on the main road, where I hoped to establish communication with the battalions. If I had taken the new rear CP south of Kotelnikov, I would have been cut off from my units and would not have been able to give the necessary orders. But still at the front position, I was at first almost helpless. The remnants of the Romanian units, the soldiers who had been defeated when the Russians first surrounded Stalingrad, were slowly wandering past us. These Romanian soldiers, marching without officers and out of formation, seemed tired and listless. What else could one expect? I was now sure that the enemy had not succeeded in breaking through our positions before dark. Our withdrawal would be more successful if it took place at night. So I returned to the new field command post, which provided me with some semblance of security for a few hours. In the quiet of the night, when the noise of battle had subsided, I fell into a deep sleep. That night all divisions had been told, holding the bridgehead at Kotelnikov is vital for further operations. Before dawn, return to the front line. Weakened battalions were again moving out into the steppes, where there was nowhere to hide. My division still had one anti-tank gun and eight tanks. All the battalion commanders were dead, and their places were taken by deputies. I traveled along my section of the front, which gave no impression of integrity, which was now commonplace. The front, however, was quiet for the time being. On my left, at a distance of two or three kilometers, I noticed Russian tanks deploying in battle order to attack. My eight tanks joined at this time a fresher battery of self-propelled assault guns. It was thanks to this battery that we had been able to break away from the enemy in the last few days. I sent a mobile battle group of tanks and self-propelled guns to meet the approaching Russian tanks, and as a result their attack on the front line was repulsed. However, other enemy tanks were already probing our left flank. The bridge we had prepared for destruction was blown up prematurely, killing twelve sappers. How to restore this bridge, vital for our retreat. The battle around Kotelnikov raged all night. Some units of our division, following erroneous orders, withdrew from the battle earlier than intended, so it was necessary to send them back into action, despite the general retreat. A critical situation was created at the division's field command post in Nadolny. Arriving there, I hurried to the building with the emblem of the operations department, but saw unfamiliar faces there. The headquarters of both divisions were located next to each other, as the retreat was supposed to be carried out through the only remaining narrow passage. I went to the CP of the 23rd Panzer Division, located next door to mine, and met with its commander. General Count von Bunberg was, like me, an old cavalryman. The road along which we were retreating was under enemy fire. In order somehow to diffuse the atmosphere of tension, I ordered my already prepared luggage to be unpacked. Until the night of 28 December, the retreat that had been ordered did not begin. The next morning we took up new positions. The villages indicated on the map no longer existed. The exhausted troops were again in the open in temperatures of minus 25 degrees. I spent the night in a room with two dozen other guests. Half Germans, half Russians. Soldiers came in now and then to warm themselves. On 31 December, with the help of a tank attack, had to save the 63rd Grenadier Regiment, which was surrounded. His night retreat was accompanied by a brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat, which killed about 80 people, that is, 10% of the infantry. Nor was the manoeuvre to withdraw from this battle entirely successful. 
One battle group was not able to make its way to the main force of the division until the following night. This important operation to save our army in Stalingrad, we began a fortnight ago, and despite the fact that we managed to cut in at 35 kilometers, I had not the slightest illusions about its prospects. Had the Russians conducted their operations more flexibly, our two divisions, which were in a difficult position, would surely have been trapped because the route of retreat was completely unprotected to the west and east. The continued torment of the personnel acted upon me physically. The cold before my eyes was draining his strength, especially the infantry suffered. In other branches of the army it was possible to arrange that some part of the soldiers rested at night for at least an hour or two. Such sleep forgetfulness is extremely important to restore mental balance. The sleeper is easily awakened, his subconscious retains a sense of danger or fear of falling behind in an unexpected retreat. Infantry losses in manpower were so great that it was no longer necessary to organize shuttle flights of vehicles to transport companies. Until things settled down, the rear guards had a hard time. With unequal strength and inability to offer serious resistance, they were nevertheless obliged to hold on and be prepared to sacrifice themselves. The situation at the battalion's field CPs was grim. There were dead men lying around. Their bodies had to be sent to the rear for burial. There were also wounded prisoners who were suffering immensely, as their open wounds remained unprotected from the cold. With what readiness did these unfortunate Russians respond with a smile to the smile of those at whose mercy they surrendered? How fearless were the women whose houses were set ablaze by artillery shells. There was fighting going on all around, but here and there one could see them trying to subdue the flames. With a sneer they let the soldiers into their houses, while they themselves slept in cellars and barns. In fact, it was not noticeable that they hated us as much as people in those western countries that were invaded. Maybe these Russian women were too far removed from politics to hate. And they still had enough piety left in them to hope, finding comfort in their icons. During the first ten days of 1943, I changed the location of my main CP only once, as the front stabilized a little. To us as a replenishment arrived SS Division from the 1st Tank Army, transferred from the Caucasus, there was also the 16th Motorized Division, under the command of Count Shurin. For a long time at least, this division was overseeing a large gap between the left flank of the Caucasus Army and the 6th Army in Stalingrad. Such large gaps were typical of this campaign. The vast Russian spaces absorbed so many men. All the filled positions had their gaps too. The 17th Panzer Division drew new strength not only from Corps sent reinforcements, but also from its own reserves. It was again possible to lay defensive lines in close proximity to settlements, which immediately improved the situation in the troops. On 3 January the division received a resupply of 50 tanks. The fighting from 2 to 7 January at Malakuberla and from 7 to 10 January around Kutinikov and northwest along the Sala broke up into a number of separate skirmishes. Again, the division's combat groups found themselves separated from each other by up to 30 kilometers, making joint operations much more difficult. It was impossible to achieve success without constant regrouping of forces and concentrated use of armored vehicles. In addition, light artillery batteries, anti-aircraft batteries used for ground action, Batteries of powered guns and assault guns had to be normally attached to separate battle groups, as the infantry alone had no effective anti-tank weapons. The nature of the fighting had changed. Now the division did not act alone. In addition, there was less fear that the high command would order the division to hold a certain position to the last. Of course, there was a growing feeling that the corps would be instructed to avoid encirclement. Such a danger still persisted. In the territory between the Saal and the Don, unprotected by German troops, the enemy was advancing further and further, thus encircling the corps from the north. Nevertheless, the frontal offensive was weakening. The Russians were advancing so rapidly that they began to suffer from supply problems, as did all rapidly advancing troops in the Russian theater of war. The Russian infantrymen, having no nearby villages to rest in, 
had to spend the night in prepared positions before attacking, which somewhat weakened their forces. The supply of fuel and spare parts for tanks was disrupted, as lorries were needed. They did not suffer from the lack of food, as they had captured many German warehouses. With this nature of fighting, I no longer had the opportunity to spend every day in the main battlefields. Operations control usually required my presence at a field CP, but I was able to visit one or two of these sites each day. Although the troops fought almost without respite, they needed a few hours rest in some house, either in lorries on the march or in a quieter section of the front. Their commanders also had to somehow carve out time for rest. In Kotelnikov, I lived with my adjutant in a rather uncomfortable house belonging to a typical state farm, where the housework was done by an elderly Kalnik woman. We were in the Kalnik steppes. In Ermakov, I also had a small house in which I managed to spend two or three quiet nights in a row. The head of the operations department was in the habit of waking me up on any important matter. It was not difficult for me to shake off my drowsiness and be as awake as during the day. As soon as I lay down again, I was instantly asleep. What little is needed for a man who is constantly facing death? Sleep, shelter from the cold, food, nothing more. I fell asleep in small huts, where there was always a so-called Stalinist bed, an iron bunk. Almost every morning, even if I was out all night, I took a cold shower in a rubber tub, followed by breakfast with strong tea. On the rare occasions when I had to leave my CP quickly, I never abandoned my luggage. Since I usually returned to the field CP, I always managed to keep warm there for two or three hours, whether it was day or night. You can bear the brutal cold as long as you know that you can warm up somewhere. And if there is no such prospect, as it happened to our troops on the Russian front, the cold can turn into a horror. In these small huts in the steppes, I found not only warmth and a bed. Often I felt the coziness of a small primitive dwelling, enjoyed the simplicity of a few pieces of peasant furniture, the purity of the whitewashed walls, the iron bed, the unpainted table, chair, and chest. The dim light of a candle was reflected in the tarnished gold of an ancient icon, and steam from hot tea was coming from a mug. Often there was still a smile on the face of some hospitable Russian peasant woman. We were never short of food, because our rations were quite sufficient for normal service, and there were still inviolable reserves, which were carefully saved. True, there were no potatoes, no vegetables, and certainly no fruit. The four or five of us always dined in the flat of the chief of operations, always tired, and to the constant accompaniment of ringing telephones, which tended to bring unpleasant news. Here was the meeting place for the commissioned officers after their desperate traveling up and down the battlefield. Frozen to the bone, they brought a wave of icy clean air into the stuffy room. On January 3, the point from which our line of defense unfolded a front from east to north was Vesely Guy. It was there that the second attack was repulsed at five o'clock in the morning. This large village was defended on three sides by weakened battalions of the 40th Grenadier Regiment. All tanks and assault guns division left as a mobile operational reserve. At about nine o'clock in the morning, the enemy launched another powerful attack. He managed to break into the locality with tanks and infantry, despite the resistance of exhausted and largely weakened companies. One of these tank routes reached the river flowing north of the settlement. Eventually I managed to repel their onslaught by throwing tanks and assault guns into the battle. When I entered Vesely Guy, the only unit left there was a small group under Lieutenant Fink, deputy battalion commander, defending the position against superior enemy forces. Russian rocket launchers blazed across the steppe, and almost immediately shells began to burst everywhere. Fink gathered his men around him. In front of the house, where the soldiers were warmed, lay the dead. The lieutenant told me about everything that was happening around this house. Just recently Russian T-34s had surrounded it, but our tanks drove them back. The next attack on this village in the afternoon was repelled. Despite the work of our ground reconnaissance, the situation north of the Sal River in the days leading up to these events remained unclear. 
By 3 January, we received a report of a large concentration of the enemy in the village on the bank of the Sal northeast of its confluence with the Little Kuberl, which was confirmed by air reconnaissance. At the same time, it was reported that large motorized units were moving in a southwesterly direction from the woods in Sukhasolanum, while Prostorny was reported to be occupied by the enemy. On 4 January, it was reported that one battalion of the enemy was marching towards Solovsky. On the same day our reconnaissance, having reached the dawn, found in Romanovskaya motor infantry and armored vehicles heading west. As a result, my division was forced to stretch its north-facing defensive line westwards along the southern bank of the Sala to Semenkinskaya. As these maneuvers endangered the rear services, a strong detachment was sent to help them to Martinovskaya, 40 kilometers west of our division's left flank on the bank of the Sala. Already on 3 January, the division planned an offensive with limited objectives to get rid of the triple threat. Frontal pressure at two points, a dangerous position on the left flank, and a large-scale coverage of rear communications. This plan could not be carried out before 5 January, for we had to defend at every point along the whole front. The court wanted, in addition, to break through the cell in a northwesterly direction all the way to the Don. For this purpose, the 156th Grenadier Regiment, which had just been attached to it, was taken off the right flank on 4 January, concentrated near Kutinikov, and sent to the bridgehead in Verknyaya Serebryakovka before dawn. It was tasked with holding this bridgehead, which was essential for further advance, and providing flank protection to the north, and if necessary, to the northwest for a tank attack reinforced by the 203rd Assault Gun Battery. The commander of the 156th Grenadier Regiment was designated as the commander of this battle group. At 5 a.m. on 5 January, the battle group began to move out of the bridgehead, Map 5. The movement was hampered by the thaw that had begun. Firepower of tanks and artillery was weak due to lack of ammunition. Fire support was provided by the divisional artillery south of Sala. Soon after the battle group crossed to the north bank of this river, it was attacked in the northeast from the direction of Petakov. The group commander sent assault guns and regimental units to repel the enemy. Continuing the offensive in the northern direction, the battle group encountered a strong enemy, but it managed to repel them. In this way, the group broke through the enemy's forward line which was evidently preparing to strike at the division's front from the north and northwest. For the Russians, it was a surprise. They did not expect an attack from the enemy, who was forced to go completely on the defensive. The fact is that our battle group made its sortie from the bridgehead through a very narrow gap. Its reconnaissance established that the enemy occupies settlements on the Sala, located to the west of this gap, namely, Farms Stolovsky, Turnovoy, and village Tuminkinskaya. Everything now depended on our battle group successfully developing its surprise offensive and rapidly occupying the territories to the north and northwest. Still protected by the heights of the terrain, the group penetrated so deeply into enemy territory that it was able to fully deploy before the next attack. It then descended from the crest of the high ground to open fire unexpectedly from the southwest on the enemy who was moving in that direction under the cover of the heights. The blow dealt to his tanks and motorized infantry proved devastating, for no one had expected a powerful attack by German tanks on the north bank of the Sala. The enemy was pushed back to Prosternoy, and by 10 o'clock we reached the road connecting the villages of Semenkinskaya and Romanovskaya. The Russians reacted quickly, sending reinforcements from the north to the retreating units. From this we could conclude that they had already thrown these units on the left flank of my division, which at the same time was the left flank of our army. By 10.30, the armored group was again threatening the Russians, who had concentrated in the Sukhasalan forest and were again trying to advance from it to the southwest. West of our battle group, the Russians were also pulling up forces from the north and south, using their western units already advancing towards Sala. The fire of our tanks destroyed two batteries and 22 anti-tank guns of the enemy. Because of the continuous fire, the battle group began to run out of ammunition, and in order to avoid encirclement, 
it was necessary to order its return to the bridgehead. As it was the only tank unit in the division, it could not be jeopardized. Before the armored group could withdraw through the defensive line of the 156th Grenadier Regiment on our bridgehead, the enemy, having received reinforcements, launched a new attack on the bridgehead with tanks and infantry from the Petokov area. To protect our troops, we undertook a counterattack with tanks and assault batteries, and the enemy again retreated, suffering heavy losses. By 17.00, all units of the battle group were again under the stable control of the division command south of the Sol Kuberl section. In the tank battle north of Sel, the Russians lost 31 tanks, of which some were burned, and some were deprived of movement, and 25 anti-tank guns. German losses totaled three tanks and 129 killed on the entire division front line. The tank attack and the destruction of more than 30 enemy tanks on 5 January greatly relieved the pressure on our division and the 4th Tank Army. So far, in a limited area from the enemy was snatched tactical initiative. Moreover, this localized offensive demonstrated to him that my division was at least capable of securing a respite, even as the threat to its rear communications grew. On 6 and 7 January, the division continued to hold its former main fighting position, although the enemy was constantly and riskily infiltrating across the Saal to the north bank. Apparently, he had not abandoned his intention of using a relatively small force there to force the 4th Tank Army to retreat. On 6 January, the 40th Grenadier Regiment was forced to pull in its northern flank, as it was not possible to clear the enemy from the north bank of the Saal. The next day, the regiment was still fighting with its front to the east on the main battle line. My forward CP was in Veseloy at this time, and I ordered the 156th Grenadier Regiment to launch a localized attack in an easterly direction, while allowing the tanks to strike independently in the direction of Budinovskaya and Bratskaya to try and clear the southern bank. My forward CP found itself drawn into close combat with the Russian infantry. Meanwhile, to the north of us, German tanks advanced eastwards, building up their attack as ordered by their commander, until they met the enemy advancing from Novaya Serebryakovka to the southwest. Our tanks made a surprise attack from the flank, thus giving the 40th Grenadier Regiment an opportunity to get out of a dangerous position. The enemy lost 11 tanks, several hundred killed, and 153 prisoners. To the south, the 203rd Assault Gun Battery was used to repel attacks on the Sapper Battalion at Adamansko. Thanks to such diversionary strikes of our tank units by 17 January, it was possible to withdraw our division behind Bolshaya Kubril without serious losses. The situation in the rear during these days was constantly deteriorating, and on 6 January, the entire 63rd Grenadier Regiment was sent there. It had the task to lead the offensive along the line Denisovsky. Rilskaya in the direction of Nemetskoy Poltovskoy and Moskovsky, and to block this area for further infiltration of the enemy through the cell. On 8 January, the enemy again tried to find a solution on the main front line, this time with more powerful infantry forces. I was again at the forward CP, standing at the bend between the northern and eastern fronts, where I kept at the ready the tank battalion which had pushed the enemy in the morning from Sundov, Ilimov, and Budinovskaya back to the cell. Bridges blown up at Bolshaya Kuberla prevented the planned further advance on Bratskaya and Ozersky. At noon, suddenly, and without artillery preparation, the enemy launched a short strike with rocket launchers before bringing three infantry regiments from the Novaya Serebryakovka, Adamansky area, into action on a wide section of the front against our forces on the northern section of the eastern front. I ordered a tank battalion to cross the river on a reconnaissance bridge east of Veselogo, and then move to Novaya Serebryakovka and turn south to hit the flank of the attacking enemy infantry division. This tank battalion was first assigned a new company consisting of ten Tiger tanks. The operational use of these tanks was hampered by the fact that there was an order from the high command that no Tiger should fall into enemy hands. The best way to provide them with protection was to subordinate them to the division's tank battalion. 
In turn, a company of tigers covered from all sides could protect the division's tanks by firing at the enemy's mobile anti-tank guns from a greater distance than conventional tanks. Thanks to this, the tanks of our division, closed from enemy anti-tank fire, attacked the enemy infantry and destroyed an entire division. The German tanks, traveling back and forth for hours, inflicted on the enemy losses of about a thousand men. Here is a terrible illustration of the helplessness of a single fighter in front of unobstructed tanks. At sunset the enemy tried to take revenge for his heavy defeat by sending 27 T-34 tanks to Kutinikov, but they were repulsed. The attack of our tanks, which lasted only an hour or two, allowed the division, despite fatigue, to withdraw in proper order and with minimal losses to a new defensive line. Our armor power remained intact. In this battle took part and artillery. Its officers' observers moved together with the tanks. However, because of the peculiarities of the battle between tanks and infantry, it had no worthy targets. These two examples of the use of battle groups are typical of such a technique, when armored vehicles are concentrated in defense, but at the right moment are used for offensive action. Commanders not very familiar with tank warfare tactics and those who dealt only with a continuous front, loosely occupied and threatened by enemy tanks, were tempted in such circumstances to atomize their tank forces. In no section of the front was the divisional infantry able to repel tank attacks by relying on its own forces alone. In those days it had neither handheld anti-tank grenade launchers nor anti-tank rocket launchers. On the main front, which stretched for almost 40 kilometers, we had the following weapons for anti-tank defense. Eight 75mm self-propelled guns, four 76.2mm self-propelled guns, and one 75mm anti-tank gun. We sent some of these assets to the threatened rear area. The so-called heavy anti-tank weapons proved largely useless during these operations, primarily because they were supplied with unsuitable ammunition. In both cases, the rear communications were so threatened that from a tactical point of view, it was best to send the armored vehicles to the rear, as the division could have been cut off. Yet I refused to take such a step. Only by concentrating all available tanks at one point could any decent results be achieved, if only for a short time. These two examples show that in such a situation it is impossible to provide effective artillery support. On 5 January, it was impossible to denude the front, using the artillery scattered across it to provide fire support for the tanks, which had advanced, conducting an offensive against the enemy, far ahead. And there were no self-propelled guns in the divisional artillery anyway. In the second example, when a Russian infantry division attacked the main front line, the artillery was able to control the fire, with the help of its observer officers, but could not conduct it effectively as the battle broke up into separate battles between tanks and infantry. During offensive engagements the main battle group was almost always under my personal command, but this was not the case with the armored battle group, which for a general defensive task was used for offensive action. Because of the threat to the weakened front, I had to be always in its center, because I could not delegate the decision-making necessary there to the chief of operations. But in both cases I chose the forward CP, from which I could intervene directly in the northern bend of the main front, and also in the hot spot during the offensive, when it became necessary to organize interaction between the different branches of the army. From there I had the shortest line of radio communication with the armored group, and just in case I maintained it. On 8 January this group formed a sort of semicircle at my CP, while I remained there directing the operation. The armored group was usually given a lot of assault guns, whenever it was necessary to send separate companies for anti-tank defense, as was the case on both occasions on the distant right flank. Such a company was subordinated to a battery of assault guns, but no tanks from tank units were sent. In this environment the assault guns proved themselves to be excellent. They had no turrets that rotated 360 degrees, so they could only successfully engage the enemy by their mobility on the battlefield. In the absence of turrets, the crews were unprotected. Good all-round visibility provided them with a better understanding of the situation.
Ten Tigers significantly strengthened the offensive power of tank troops. Their armor and effective armament created them superiority over the T-34, so they could dominate the battlefield, while providing protection to weaker tanks. They raised offensive morale, but did not fulfill the hopes that the German High Command had for them, as their numbers were insufficient. In addition, it soon became clear that the Heavy Tigers were too clumsy for the usual mobile tactics of my division. They had mass but not horsepower, and they could not adapt to rapid combat. Orders that they must not fall into enemy hands restrained their use. Frequent inquiries from the OKB suggested that Hitler expected too much from these Tiger companies. Their numbers were insufficient for them to play a decisive role in any major battle. In severe frosts, their own enormous weight made it dangerous for them to slip on icy slopes. If this happened, or if they were immobilized by a shell hit, it took two other Tigers to pull them out, had the Russians realized their air superiority, which they never did. Hardly a large number of fast and well-armored tanks could have survived in this vast country. The Changing Nature of Warfare According to the classical canons of war, the supreme command of the Russian army, simultaneously with the encirclement of the Sixth Army at Stalingrad, should have developed a breakthrough and ruthlessly pursued the Germans with powerful forces along the Don in a southwestern direction and thus cut off the First and Fourth German Panzer Armies. The marked Russian movements north of Sala and the capture in the rear of the German front of such settlements as Matikovka allowed us to conclude that they actually had such intentions. Nevertheless, it was also obvious that their breakthroughs through gaps in the front, deep enough, could not be regarded as a pursuit of a still mobile, albeit defeated, army. Since the entire southern German front began to collapse, the question of a parallel pursuit was no longer a question of parallel pursuit, it was a question of frontal pursuit on a very wide front. However, such a front had to be filled, and for this purpose the victorious pursuer had to seek additional forces. At all times he had to try to keep the pursuing enemy columns in contact with each other and avoid any large gaps in their offensive orders. The laws of warfare require relentless pursuit until man and beast give up the spirit. This means nightly preparations and continuous day and night marches to literally step on the heels of the retreating enemy. The devastation the latter leaves behind him adds to the pursuer's difficulties of supply. In the end, fuel shortages force him to turn his task over to the cavalry, which requires fewer supplies and is more mobile on the ground, though not as effective in combat. The actions described took place in conditions where frosts were followed by thaws. The latter were particularly hard for the soldiers, when their soaked uniforms were covered with ice as soon as the frost began. At night, the Russians laid siege to the villages which we used for rest and recuperation. The instinct of self-preservation compelled us to defend these villages to the last. It is hardly surprising, therefore, that it was impossible to maintain the same rate of pursuit as in past wars. It was weakened by lack of strength. If the defeated side has a more or less experienced command and is able to ensure a continuous supply of its armored units, it can maintain its existence because the pursuer is not able to simply destroy it in the style of the old tactics of attacking cavalry when the enemy was taken by surprise and had no tanks. When circumstances forced a shift to defensive action, the German operational command had a practice of keeping in readiness in the rear of each front of the so-called fire brigade of one or two tank companies. Often they were allocated from their own divisions to operate against enemy tanks that had broken through. The fire brigades would suddenly attack these tanks from the flank, destroying them or holding them back until more powerful reserves arrived. However, even in frontal defense the tanks proved their superiority over all anti-tank means. As soon as they occupied a concealed prepared position, they immediately became the defensive weapon that the enemy feared most. Mobility and combat power of single tanks provided them with the ability to fully utilize any folds of terrain. Thus, tank divisions, originally created as purely offensive forces, proved to be the most effective in defensive operations. A modern defense system is always built in sections and zones, and never in a linear fashion. 
but mobile defense requires mobile, emotorized, formations. Motorized reserves can be quickly moved from one flank to the other or pulled up from depth. Infantry, an integral part of tank forces, is trained to interact with tanks. Tank rear guards can independently hold forward positions until the final moment, when they suddenly and without warning withdraw from the battle and retreat. Thus, large-scale operations were of a different nature from those conducted in World War I or the early stages of World War I. It was now possible to temporarily hold a front, such as the 4th Panzer Army had in the episodes described above, despite the fact that the enemy, pursuing in parallel, had already overcome it. Consequently, it was possible to ignore occasional enemy threats to our rear units and communications, which we did. There was always a chance that somewhere the front might hold. As it turned out, the 1st and 4th tank armies could get behind the dawn, but could not stop the enemy, who pursued them on both sides of the river. Making a march to the Dnieper, these tank armies, however, began a counter-offensive on the Donitz River, thanks to which not just defeated the enemy and turned into pursuers. Because of this change in the nature of hostilities was born the misconception that the advantage, which in war is determined by the loss of strategic power of one side and the corresponding gain of the other, is inevitable and in the future does not leave the defeated any hope. This delusion proved disastrous for the German side. A government which has a clear view of the situation and tries to end the war while it still has some power to negotiate is not weak but strong. Such a government must be aware of its responsibility to the people for its political course and strategy. If this condition is not fulfilled, there is no sound basis for strategy. Selected Impressions I led most of these battles personally, and, being in the center of the action, witnessed the close combat and action of tanks against helpless enemy infantry. During the tank attack on 8 January, I was among those who saw hundreds of Russian infantrymen who were out of contact and out of control, unwilling to surrender and were destroyed. In the midst of the battle, a 16-year-old Kalmyk youth on a stunted horse, who hoped to somehow get to his home, accidentally rode out of the rear. He rode up to the trench where I was with one of the battalion commanders. I was touched by the simplicity of this lad. The intense cold and the vast open space of the steps almost cancelled out the monotonous rumble of tank guns and the bursting of their shells. Such was the lad's acquaintance with the ominous drama of battle that he cried. War demands cruelty. I could forgive many failures on account of the terrible cold, but I was not prepared to accept that a division performing a difficult task should suffer from any lapses of its chiefs. The severe measures I had to take against individual shortcomings and the increasing numbers of killed, wounded and captured were a heavy burden on my shoulders. Even more troubling were other problems. Once I was awakened in the middle of the night to acknowledge receipt of an important order from Hitler the content of which was that he would justify any officer who did not stop short of killing women and children in the fight against the partisans. Hitler explained that this order was prompted by the verdict of a court-martial of one officer, which he had not approved because it was too lenient. Such orders annoyed most and burdened the conscience. In such cases, I usually held a brief meeting, this time with my chief of operations, ending with a directive that the order should not be circulated among the troops. However, it was still restless at heart. The order was inevitably announced throughout the army. The fight against the guerrillas was always brutal, as their actions were considered illegal and insidious. Often they had complete control of entire towns and villages where they terrorized the population into giving them aid. Therefore, there were always seemingly extenuating circumstances for the extreme measures taken against them by our troops, including the killing of women and children as stated in Hitler's order. In this matter, I could only hope that I would never be required to organize such things by the troops under my command. And this hope was kept alive as long as the southern part of our eastern front faced much less partisan activity than the central part. Sometimes I stayed at a flat in some place remote from the main thoroughfare. Ordering a dark green box with a service radio to be delivered, I enjoyed a few hours of complete peace. These were unforgettable hours when, from some country far from the front, 
the receiver would catch the creations of outstanding German composers. I reflected on the fact that as I grew older, I became more and more attracted to the old masters of German music, and there seemed to be more programs to suit my taste than ever before, so I had no difficulty in finding what I liked. If by chance I managed to catch the Brandenburg Concerto, or Bach's Cantata, or Handel's Messiah, my joy was accompanied by deep emotions. At first I simply enjoyed the musical intonations and rhythms as the cadences increased. Then a feeling of pain for the senseless victims of war came over me. My thoughts went back to my family, living alone in our home, experiencing perhaps greater hardships than I had experienced as an officer in the active army. Would I ever meet my son again, facing the enemy somewhere on this same front, or, like so many others, had he already flown back to the Stalingrad, sacked, to end his days in pain and suffering? Then the last triumphant chords revived in me a feeling of great happiness, confidence, and hope. Would our swift and inevitable retreat back to my native country bring me back? Would the horrors of National Socialism disappear, and would the Germans, though defeated, be able to restore normal relations with other nations? A deep peace prevailed in my soul and filled me with joy. The mysterious waves on the airwaves gave me for a while a rosier view of humanity.